On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have an all-star cast. Brian, Curtis, Heather, and I pull out our crystal balls and do our best at the 2020 Enterprise Predictions. You shouldn't miss it. Twilight on the set. LastPass Studios brings you this week in Enterprise Tech. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 374, recorded December 16th, 2019, for January 3rd, 2020. Deep fake crystal balls. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technologies Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab with more than a half billion dollars of equipment, including OEMs like Dell EMC. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it offers, go to WWT.com slash twit. And by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV provides IT training that's effective and entertaining with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use code enterprise30 at checkout. And by Melissa. Bad data happens to good companies. That's why 10,000 businesses count on Melissa for clean, reliable address data. Get started today with 25,000 records clean for free. That's a $75 value at melissa.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, and today we want to wish you a happy new year from all of us here on Twyat, because not only are we going to take you through some of our predictions from last year, but we're going to give you our predictions. We're going to pull out our crystal ball and give you our predictions for 2020 as well. But I can't guide you to this big enterprise world by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Wi-Fi, queen of Wi-Fi, that is, Miss Mrs. Heather Williams. Uh, Heather, welcome back. I heard you had a, a, a really great trip across the pond there. I did. Black Hat went very well. It was a really great uh, show. And then I extended my trip to uh, have some high tea, uh, check out a show or two and uh, and visit some museums. So it was absolutely fantastic trip. Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, we can't do our prediction show without our favorite security journalist, our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, welcome back and happy holidays, my friend. Well, thank you so very much. It's great to be here. Uh, always a pleasure to to get ready to go from one year to the next and from one decade to the next with everyone on Twyatt. Thanks, Chris. Well, we couldn't do our prediction show without our favorite geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. Welcome back to the show. And you know, we're gonna have a, you're gonna have a trip this year that you're gonna go on. Is that right? Um. Well, you know, not sure yet. But if all goes well, this coming year we're gonna be moving coast. So I'm gonna be moving from Hawaii to Florida. Anyway, it is the new year. Mele Kalikimaka, which is Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. Eho'ole Makahiki Ho, which means and a Happy New Year. Um, may this be a great year to every one of you and yours. To you as well. See you as well. Well, folks, we have a jam-packed show for you today. Not only we're gonna we're gonna take you through last year's predictions and see how well we did, as well, we're gonna bring in our crystal balls and we're gonna give you some new ones for 2020. And to start all that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chibert. Chibert. Well, first off, we're going to start off with the predictions on the first half of 2019. These are the ones that we thought were going to happen sometime before the June time frame. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have the person made prediction, talk about it real briefly, and then a little bit about whether they think they made it or not. And then we're going to go through the other hosts and say thumbs up or thumbs down. So the first prediction for the first half of 2019 goes to our host with the most, Mr. Lou Maresca. 
Thanks, Jeebert. Yeah, so I mean, last year, my first prediction for the first part of the year was definitely that DevOps was kind of that, you know, that that new lustry thing that everyone was going after. But I just thought, you know what, it, it was time of that time of the year where people are going to start to adopt it. And the reason is only because it really helps um, make sure that your customers are getting value all the time. That can kind of continuous deployment, continuous deployment mindset, continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous uh, value that you're bringing to your customers. And a lot of organizations were starting to see that. In fact, we saw a bunch of startups uh, in the beginning of the part of the year that started up that, that dealt with it, as well as we saw other startups like, for instance, we saw continuous compliance, compliance as a service, that kind of thing, uh, you know, come out uh, last year as well. So I definitely think that DevOps not only was a lustry, that kind of lustry thing that everyone was going after, but people started to adopt it quite a bit. And we hear throughout this entire year uh, of different applications of this, whether you're on AWS or Azure or you're doing on-premise, there's definitely models that you can follow, best practices. And in fact, a lot of corporations out there have started themselves adopting these models. So I, I definitely think, for me, definitely a success. What do you guys think? Well, Mr. Kurt, you're first up. What do you think, yay or nay? Well, I, I do think yay. I think that uh, what we have seen is that DevOps has become more and more just the way things are being done. Uh, you don't have to argue in favor of it with the exception of a handful of very hidebound sort of traditionalist companies. For most, though, DevOps is just the way things are done. Mo, you're up. Yay or nay? Well, I think we uh, we we all said yay to it uh, when it, he first uh, proposed this, and I think that uh, we all still agree with that. Um, the last uh, line of his uh, prediction was incorporating uh, that that uh, people are going to be investing in DevOps and security this year, um, and that was for 2019. And I think that actually uh, it turned out pretty accurate. And I'm going to repeat what I said last year: is that my my fingers are crossed that uh, maybe next year is the year that uh, DevOps becomes um, sec DevOps. Sounds terrific. And sadly, we, we weren't able to get Brian McHenry on this particular prediction show, but I am pretty sure he will agree with you because of the amount of effort that F5 has put in. I also agree that DevOps, and I also agree that Mo's dead on. I think DevSecOps will be happening. But the next one comes from Kurt, and he's going to be talking about AR. Will it become part of the business landscape? So, Mr. Well, Kurt. I had, thank you so much. I had said that this one was basically a slam dunk. Why? Because augmented reality, or as some companies uh, have it, mixed reality, is already part of quite a few technical field jobs. Things like field maintenance, inspection, all kinds of other things you're seeing it being used to replace just masses of manuals and to some extent, the hands-on experience that allowed the job to be done. Now, I had said that I thought that data scientists and financial services quants were going to be using it because of the sheer complexity of the data sets that they needed to go through, basically because they need a more 3D rich way of looking at those incredibly complex data sets. I thought that something like the Oculus Rift headsets would become commonplace. Uh, I did feel that it was going to be headsets and not the phone-based. That just doesn't work. I was disappointed, though. It didn't happen the way I thought it would, and there's a really good reason. That reason is that machine learning and artificial intelligence have become far more important in the world of business. You're seeing those technologies take over and simplify the data sets to the point that the human analysts don't need the augmented reality to get the work done. So this one, I would say I missed on because I didn't see the rise of another technology to take its place. Lou, what do you think? 
No, I definitely agree. It was definitely adopted this year. Um, I would say the latter half of the year for sure. I think we started to see, in fact, we did a couple stories in our previous episodes about AR being applied in manufacturing um, and in warehouses and so on and so forth. Um, and field services was big. Uh, I couldn't remember the name of the company, but they were actually applying this to fixing machinery in, 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 in manufacturing where they would put out their field service people with um, you know, HoloLens or whatnot to apply uh, that use to, uh, you know, helping them actually fix the different issues, you know, walk them through guides on fix, fixing the machines. Uh, and that was applied in, in, in bulk to their, to, their, to their industry. So I definitely think that it was on the rise. Um, the applications were small in the very beginning, beginning part of the year. But I definitely think in the latter part of the year, we started to see this adoption, uh, especially with kind of the second release of HoloLens that kind of came out. Um, just recently. And so I think the year ended strong there. Uh, and I definitely think this year coming, we'll see even more application for sure. Mo, what do you think? Well, I'm going to agree uh, to uh, a large extent with with Lou. I think that, uh, Kurt, it may, uh, the adoption may not have happened to the extent that you were looking for on the enterprise side. Um, but it, I think we saw it uh, uh, AR being adopted in some other places, including, don't forget, um, healthcare. Um, I also would like to point out that sometimes things don't get adopted as fast on the enterprise side that we look at and think it's self-evident, but it ends up making more of an inroads on the education or the, the inter, sorry, the entertainment or the uh, edutainment uh, side of things. So if you, if we'll skip from AR and, and look at the VR and the, those headsets, um, I'm not going to say that we had just we were partying all the time at the Black Hat Knock, but there was some game playing going on. And given how good some of those guys were at some of those uh, VR games, they spent a good part of 2019 um, educating themselves on that. Oh, right on. Well, I'm going to say we hit almost just barely missed. And I think one of the reasons is that the vast majority of those um, headsets aren't made in the United States. And the U.S. military, even though they've invested a lot of money into the technology, came up to a screeching halt when they realized they can't buy U.S.-made equipment. So now I know the military market doesn't – isn't the flea on the tail of the dog wagging dog. It, it's it, – you know, there are other things. But it is a major enough market, and the spinoffs for military spending tend to also develop an awful lot of other industries. So I think it's rather more like being postponed. So anyway, we're going to go roll on to Miss Mo. Mo, you <laughs> had something on IoT, something about it. War of the Worlds? What? <laughs> I went on a little bit of a rant. Actually, so I, I started by lawyering at myself because, first of all, this uh, this might be a popular show for the <laughs> for the crowd. But for putting uh, predictions like this together, I absolutely loathe it. I consider myself to be like one of the world's worst futurists. So it's, a, it's actually sort of painful. Um, and the War of the Worlds reference was that it's a lot, um, as we saw from that, uh, that book, it wasn't uh, all that. He was very accurate in predicting sometimes new technologies. It's a little harder. It's a lot harder, actually, to uh, understand what the actual impact to our everyday world is going to be with some of those technologies. So I sort of went on this IoT rant. Um, I felt, felt that as much as I don't uh, – I push against IoT, I thought that it was actually going to end up being a lot more of a help with uh, things like healthcare uh, in terms of helping uh, – support the remote and the underserved i you know i that's just going to be uh the nature of the necessity of it we just don't have enough um doctors in rural areas and things like that i, I, I don't i think that we i sort of missed on that um i don't know that i predicted as much of the how much of the wearables um, were going to come into um uh, uh, effect i uh, all across london i was uh, looking at ads from uh, life insurance and health insurance um, companies saying that, you know, if you'll wear this wearable and, you know, download our app and maintain, you know, a certain level of activity and fitness, you get all these discounts and benefits and things. And so I think that that 
that part was a little bit uh, of of a of a plus uh, or a, a hit, but I, I I wouldn't say that I actually called it on that. Um, I did in that same uh, rant uh, make a prediction that we wouldn't be using as many. Uh, individual personal devices and and Kurt, if I remember, to, uh, but it did a big thumbs down on that. Um, I'm still going to stand by that one. I have gone from using multiple individual devices to basically consolidating, and I did, Curtis, um, take a poll of the younger crowd, and uh, they sort of agree. They're 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 uh, all of my kids are currently on a more of a minimalist um, uh, stance when it comes to things like that. So it may be that all of our personal devices have become um, powerful enough that we can collapse them into just the one device that's uh, or one. Device Device that's uh, uh, doing uh, multitasking, whereas before, maybe in, in previous years, we were using lots of different individual devices for um, various things. Well, in this case, the other three gangs said possible. So, Lou, why don't you take out, take off on why you thought it's possible, or did it actually happen? Yeah, I think that the, um, you know, I definitely think from a personal electronics, a personal device perspective, I definitely think that that was kind of like, I would say, slow to adopt. I think a lot of people are still kind of utilizing these personal devices uh, to their extent. Um, but then when it comes to IoT, per, especially in healthcare, I think those things have skyrocketed. I definitely think maybe maybe not in the beginning of the year, but definitely throughout the rest of the year, we started seeing a bunch of adoptions, um, especially around uh, detection of, of different um, aspects and different um, types of conditions. Um, I saw a bunch of devices come out recently, uh, you know, especially around diabetes and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of outspoken people on Twitter um, are utilizing and actually demo, demoing these things. Um, and so I definitely think that that's a big thing. And in fact, there's some new policies that came out from, from a health care perspective that cover some of these devices um, that have been um, approved by the FDA. And I definitely think that that's going to continue uh, to be on the rise because that means that, you know, especially insurance companies are going to have continuous feeds of information uh, about people's conditions and helps them judge and in in predict in the future as well. But I, I, I would say in the beginning of the year, we definitely saw this, especially from a CES perspective and other things. Uh, but I definitely think from the, from the latter half of the year, we saw more, more of an adoption from that perspective. Kurt, you're up. Well, you know, when I when I think about minimalism, um, I think that perhaps I'm not the best person to talk about it. As I, as I look about on my desk, uh, I see seven separate active devices right now, um, each of which has its role, each of which uh, does its own special part in my day-to-day -day activity. I will say, though, <clears throat> that I have seen others uh, especially, uh, as Mo indicated, her kids, my son, uh, is down to, to two devices. Um, and frankly, only uh, the, the only reason he has the second is that he does some, uh, some rendering uh, of game images and things like that. I do think that we are seeing the smaller uh, devices become more and more capable. Um, and so... You know, I, I think we're heading in that direction, although I, I still think that there are some natural limits. Um, with that said, it may be that I'm just destined to be that, that curmudgeonly outlier on this one, in which case I'll be the one with the rolling footlocker and all my gear tagging behind everyone else. Yeah, I've seen your Pelican case, so I know how big that footlocker is. <clears throat> well, my... I said possible. I'm actually going to try and lean towards it happened. But I'm actually seeing it being hidden from view. The world of building management has adopted IoT in a huge way. Um, I'm seeing smart breaker panels, for God's sakes. And more and more of elevators. To, in order to stay competitive, all the major elevator builders have now built in a lot of IoT to the point where they will phone home even before a part breaks. And the amount of adoption I've seen within the electrical, power, and water industries is staggering. I agree with Kurt and Lou that a lot of the uh, consumer gear is starting to condense. 
you know, especially as we get more and more smartphones having more and more power. I think the so-called, if they ever figure out how to do the folding smartphones correctly and not have them break, I think that could create kind of an interesting effect where people will start um, doing different things. Anyway, <clears throat> my prediction for the first half of 2019 was gunshot detection hits the news. Um, this had a lot of mixed opinions. It, it, I think it did, but it didn't hit the news. Um, it actually caught me a little by surprise when I could find on several brands, major brands of network attached cameras. So like Access Communications is one that we've interviewed in the past. Um, the shot detection for the audio is now something where it's a standard um, stock item. You just pay a few bucks for the license and you load it and it runs on the camera and you make sure you just have the GPS locations loaded in the camera. Interesting. Lou, how'd I do? And you know, I actually think that this is this is came true. I started seeing a lot of things uh, come out, especially from CES perspective and other areas uh, in this area. And I, I, I actually think that um, the interesting thing here is that uh, it's coming to the consumer space as well. Um, because a lot of the services start updating, especially in the very we end of the beginning of the year, I'd say probably around April time frame, I started getting updates in some areas here where you start seeing, um, you know, AI start to, uh, to be appended to detection and, uh, remediation even. So, Hey, we send a, uh, we call the police if we detect, uh, specific temperature or smoke in your house, uh, or we can see the smoke using the infrared camera, uh, there's, you know, a lot of things like that started to come out, uh, and be applied, especially the services started seeing updates and upgrades. Um, so I would say, I definitely think this was true. And even in the latter half of the year, um, we started seeing it in the enterprise side as well. We started seeing this, um, in data center areas as well, where, um, you know, they were actually detecting, um, you know, the different data centers were caused. There were actually some breaches in some data centers in the previous year uh, and people were moving equipment or, or altering equipment. And so they actually have some new software now that can determine uh, static images. And if they've changed over time, people have moved equipment around or um, if they've changed the, uh, the, the kind of the setup of that. And so I definitely think that there was an adoption here. Um, and I would say you were right. Thank you. Kurt? Well, I'm going to go as well with I think that largely you were right. I'm not sure that that it's it's done uh, come out in a, precisely the way that that we might have thought listening to you, but definitely going on. And I'll tell you something that that I have seen a couple of studies on. I know that there are some researchers looking at doing things like using the various uh, ring doorbells and things like that with all of those microphones to improve the uh, location finding ability of these algorithms. So I think just like weather and other things, the proliferation of sensors is really improving what's going on. And it's not going to be very long, especially in, let's say, higher income areas where there's a greater prevalence of these smart home devices. When the question of, has someone called the police? isn't going to be an issue. The systems themselves will be smart enough to figure out, uh, even if that system itself, let's say, uh, even if your home doesn't have an incident within its perimeters that would cause the police to be called, if the neighborhood, uh, the, the array of sensors that are tied into a central network detect what should be an actionable event, the police are going to get a call and show up before a resident has a chance to know there's a problem. So I'm going to say that you got this one. Ms. Mo, your opinion, please. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and so the way you de described your prediction and, and uh, the way Kurt addressed it, it this is, you, you, you guys were focusing on the municipal uh, applications of this. Uh, I think you were specifically talking about Menlo Park as being a, um, 
an area where they were testing it. I can tell you that a lot of these sensors that uh, Lou was talking about earlier um, uh, uh, run across Wi-Fi. So I see quite a bit of uh, this and where uh, particularly uh, gunshot detection is huge is um, in the education market, in the EDU. So you, you almost can't have a conversation with um, IT departments in, uh, in schools across the U.S. without that coming up. Um, vape detection uh, was a surprising new addition to um, th their want list, but uh, gunshot detection. So I think I'm going to call you Plato on this uh, and, and go back to that quote about invention being the mother of necessity. Um, I, I think that this has turned out to be uh, a lot bigger than certainly I, I thought it would be. Um, and, and the indoor shot detection has uh, become just a huge um, market and, and a huge ask. And so you do see uh, companies like Axis stepping up to the market. And by the way, their cameras are absolutely phenomenal. So it doesn't surprise me that they wouldn't, that they would be adding this technology in as well. Well, thank you, Ms. Mo. But I think it's time to toss it over to Lou and say thank you to one of our sponsors. Well, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Worldwide Technology. Now, if you ever get a chance to visit the Worldwide Technologies Advanced Technology Center, you should definitely go because it truly is an amazing site. They begin build, They actually began building this thing 10 years ago, and it's grown exponentially. It's really like no other testing and research lab you've seen. Now, listen to what the lab has it actually contains. More than a half a billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from heavyweights like Dell, EMC, VMware, and Intel to emerging disruptors like Equinix. When you are developing products, you want to work with organization you can trust. Well, WWT is a trusted partner who will stay with you over the years. In fact, many of the customers they've been working with for over a decade because they know that WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure the business is run right. And with all that it has to offer, the ATC really is an incubator for IT innovation. Listen to what else it has to offer. On-demand and schedule labs like Dell EMC, VX Rail, Data Protection Central, and IDPA. These labs represent the newest advances in primary storage. Now, you worked on large products and products before, right? Well, sometimes you want to try and build products before you actually ship them. Well, ITC can help you learn about products before you launch. WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots using the ATC lab environment so customers can confidently select the best solution. In many cases, this reduces concept time from months to weeks, which increases speed to market. They actually offer lab as a service. It's a dedicated lab space within the ATC. Now, here customers can perform programmatic testing using the vast technology ecosystem that WWT has already built. It's virtual, so you can take full advantage of ATC's unique benefits anywhere in the world 20 Four, seven. Now, WWT's engineers work in these labs every day, beta testing new equipment and building reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions and see results faster with much less investment. If you've been eagerly waiting to get to market faster, the time is finally here. WWT has launched their new digital platform encompassing the ATC ecosystem. Now, this ecosystem creates a multiplier effect of knowledge, speed, and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. Get access to articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. To learn more about WWT and join the ATC ecosystem, go to www.com slash twit and create an account today. WWT simplifies the complex. That's www.com slash twit wwt delivering business and technology outcomes around the world and we thank worldwide technologies for their support of this week in enterprise tech well sadly last year's episode we ran out of time and didn't get a chance to talk about the long term so what we're going to do is very quickly have mr lou start off with his long-term prediction on enterprise ml transformation Thank you, sir. So, yeah, I think one of the biggest things that happened last year, especially over the, the throughout the year, was the adoption of ML. And we could see, actually see this not only in the consumer space, but the enterprise space as well, because the, the idea of a lot of uh, enterprises out there, especially large corporations calling out that there is we're weaponizing our data. And that means that we're using all of the data streams. There's a bunch of services and applications and machine learning models out there that are using this to not only predict the outcomes for different parts of the industry, but also predict behavioral uh, things as well. 
Um, and I think that you we're not only seeing this in the retail space, but we're seeing this um, in uh, many different areas as well uh, when it comes to um, repair and manufacturing. Um, we're seeing this in the space of, um, you know, in travel and transportation. Um, in fact, uh, we're starting to see pop-ups of, of, of companies like Uber and these other companies starting to use machine learning to determine uh, better routing and um, all autonomous vehicles and construct constructs for AI. Um, and I think that there's lots of things happening throughout the the latter half of the year uh, where you're starting to see big data be actually applied to business need. Uh, now, whether it's actually going to start changing uh, the economy, it, it hasn't just yet. But I definitely think that this will probably happen in the year to come. Maybe, maybe part of my prediction coming up uh, for next for this year for 2020. Uh, but I definitely think that it was applied, um, and I think that it's going to be on the rise uh, in the coming years as well. All right, Mr. Kurt, what do you think? Oh, no question. Um, we have seen a, a rise in the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the enterprise over the last year that really stunned me with its with its speed. I mean, we had seen this going up for some time, um, but if we're not there, we may have come close to reaching the hockey stick part of the adoption curve. Uh, I don't talk to anyone uh, in enterprise software who's not talking about some form of machine intelligence, whether you want to call it deep learning, machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence, some form of augmented intelligence is going on in virtually every corner of enterprise application. So I think that uh, that Lou nailed this one. If there was any fault with the prediction, it might have been that it was just a wee bit conservative. <laughs> well, you. Ms. Mo, what does the Wi-Fi queen say? Well, from a Wi-Fi point of view, this you couldn't have been more accurate on this one. The uh, uh, even down into into my industry, there's uh, talk about it across uh, different vendors. And in fact, uh, this year you saw, or in 2019, you saw the purchase uh, by Juniper of uh, Mist, which was a Wi-Fi vendor, sorta. Uh, uh, but really, what they are is machine learning that and they use Wi-Fi as their delivery mechanism. And um, in all of the communications around that, you saw them saying that they had bought an ML company. Uh, Wi-Fi was sort of the afterthought. Well, and you know what? My opinion on this is dead on it. I mean, I even have an elementary school teacher talking to me about machine learning. And when you start getting to that level where the kids are talking about it and their teachers are talking about it, I think it started... You know, I think we hit widespread. So, you know what? We're going to be talking about some interest more like that. Kurt, you have something on intelligence gets more local and the fog gets thicker? I did indeed because I predicted that what we would see is a decentralization of all of this intelligence. Instead of having to send stuff back to a large cloud installation or a glass house in the enterprise, I said that intelligence was going to be decentralized, heading out to the endpoints. Um, and part of this would be the rise of what some people call fog computing, where those endpoints are getting more intelligent, more autonomous. And I said this was going to have implications for security, device management, application architecture, and everything else. And on this one, I'm going to say I got it right. You know, we've seen a huge rise in the number of artificial intelligence and machine learning single board computers all the way down to an Arduino that runs a flavor of TensorFlow Lite. Now, many of these are special purpose in their intent with libraries for things like image or voice recognition. But the fact that the libraries exist at all and the machine capability exists means that people are being able to repurpose them to almost any application so I'm going to say that it really worked out that AI is moving on out of that big glass apartment in the sky. <laughs> Mr. Liu, do you agree with Mr. Kurt? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, we've done a bunch of stories here in Twide about, uh, you know, the existence of new libraries and new releases uh, from TensorFlow and some other things that are supposed to be able to run on mobile devices. They're supposed to be run on low power devices. So edge computing has become a huge thing and being able to apply um, these artificial um, artificial intelligence as well as machine learning models on these devices have become huge as well because not only can they happen um, on the edge, but they can happen without um, access to the internet, to the network. Um, and so you have data flowing in and you have data coming in from sensors and other areas. And then these little, these devices, not only low power devices, but sometimes high power devices can actually process this data offline. And so I, this was huge. This was actually, there's a bunch of huge applications here that were happening. Uh, and that's why you know, companies like Google were putting out uh, new releases of their models and um, of their libraries because they know that this is kind of the wave of the future. So I think you know, coming up in the years to come, we'll start to see more and more of these devices being able to handle that. Uh, and of course, the advent of 5G, we're going to start to see this even more because now you have connectivity uh, that can handle these types of things as well. Uh, from, from vehicles, transportation, manufacturing, you're going to see this kind of application all over the place for sure. So I definitely think that it happened. Mo, is AI and fog computing affecting you in the Wi-Fi world? What he said. Yeah. And Lou said right. it best. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. And you know what? I, I agree also because, ta-da, neural computing <laughs> out at the edge. So, you know, hey, it doesn't get much more of a validation than that. Um, we've got another one. This time, Voice for the Voiceless by Miss Mo. Yeah, and I'm going to admit this one was sort of a no-brainer. So it's not like I was going out on an edge on this one. So I predicted that Wi-Fi calling was going to uh, see a lot of growth, that it was going to become more, much more widely adopted. And the truth is, uh, and I'm going to stick by that one and, and say that it not only did it happen, um, it may be one of those things that is a little bit um, on the invisible side. The end user may not even uh, be aware that this is going on. But certainly the carriers uh, in an effort to offload uh, as much traffic as they can um, off of their cellular network um, have ad have adopted this, but it's also been adopted uh, widely by enterprises and it, particularly uh, the hospitality market um, has been uh, pushing this. So I think this is one of those things that happens in the background. And if you're someone like my mother, you may or may not even know that it that it's going on. Um, I also talked about uh, uh, residential uh, Wi-Fi and the fact that the uh, with all of the IoT and, and gaming and everything else, all of the, and just the fact that the backbone uh, to the houses is, is, uh, is uh, so decent now, um, that we're now to the point that uh, just residential homes and certainly high-end residential homes, the consumer grade networks are not really keeping up with that. Um, and we did see um, this year a, a wide adoption across some of the high-end home builders um, uh, bringing in um uh, and standardizing on, um, you know, uh, uh, Cat Six A um, uh, carrier and enterprise grade uh, networking equipment um, and things like that. So, um, I, I I think this one sort of happened. Right on, Lou. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we saw a lot of the latest updates from iOS and Android, including some of the older devices like the 5Cs and the 6s, uh, iPhone uh, 6s, that we saw Wi-Fi calling become actually part of the device. Um, in fact, they moved the Wi-Fi calling from uh, from not on from default to on by default, as well as they moved it up in the menus too. So they made it much closer to the surface for people to easily turn it on. Um, and we started seeing data from Project Phi this past year where they started saying, hey, we're starting to see way more people using voice, especially on Wi-Fi because of just the fact that they have higher speed internet um, and it's just a much clearer call. It's easier for them to, to have that data stream. So I definitely think Mo was correct here uh, from her aspect. Kurt, you see any changes? No, I th I'm going to agree with, with both my colleagues. We, we've seen this happening, and I don't see anything to slow it down, especially in new construction. Now, I, th I think that uh, as with virtually anything else having to do with residential or, for that matter, commercial construction, retrofitting is going to slow down the overall adoption. But even there, it's coming. And that's because this typically doesn't require actually tearing out all of the um, – uh, the the walls, all of the the physical infrastructure for the building, most places you can run something through uh, through cable chases and be in good shape. So, 
I think that Mo hit it on the head. And I also think, in fact, I've got a great example. Here in Honolulu, Spectrum Wireless, a lot of people were wondering why they were spending so much money on putting in public Wi-Fi access points all over creation. In fact, they are ruckus footballs all over, actually hung on to the wires in out in the middle of nowhere. And the reason why is they are now offering mobile services. They are an MVNO if you're not on their Wi-Fi, but their system is going to prefer Wi-Fi because of the amount of Wi-Fi public access points in the whole, in Honolulu and especially in Hawaii. So I think that one not only hit the nail on the head, but we're seeing concrete, real applications in the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I had one, and this was about autonomous freight companies will seek permission to hit the roads. Um, I think I actually did that. Uh, Jammer, we've got one uh, story from Mercury News about a self-driving truck delivered butter from California to Pennsylvania in three days. Um, so it's starting to happen. And we've already started seeing some articles about Australia having those road trains going across the outback. So it's already happening. But I've got one more piece of um, evidence, and this is – Seven companies right now are making self-driving trucks a reality. These are seven startups. And if we could go to that URL, these people have sought the permits with the uh, Federal Highways Administration, and they are starting to do uh, long-haul trucking. And now a lot of people are going to raise up their arms and say, hey, uh, that's taking away jobs from long-haul truckers. The answer really is Yes, it is, but no, it's not because a lot there is a huge, huge, huge shortage of long haul truckers. People don't seem to think that's a great career path anymore. And the number of long haul truckers has dwindled by a huge amount. So let's head to Lou. Do you agree with me? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head here for sure. Um, like you said, we've seen these different startups come out of the woodwork uh, with these different technologies, as well as uh, we're starting to see the larger companies, um, especially like Uber and some of these other companies starting to apply this as well. So, uh, you know, you know, with Tesla on the on the precipice of delivering their their electric trucks, um, you know, especially with some of these capabilities, um, we're going to see this more and more. And I, I definitely think this past year, um, you know, especially the latter half of the year, there was a direct adoption. So great job. Thank you, Mr. Kurt. What do you think? Are we going to see this happening or do you think we're going to see more happening? I think at least this will be happening and possibly more. My state, Florida, is one where they allow for experimentation in this way. And in the conversations that I've had with engineers, they tell me that if it weren't for the nasty little thing called physics, we would already be seeing uh, autonomous highway vehicles. The physics comes in because the long haul trucks are just so darn heavy. The reaction time has to be so far in advance of stuff that goes on. With that said, it's a much simpler environment than city streets. So I think we're going to see more and more taking place on the interstates, um, probably with specially marked trucks, probably with special rules about where they can get on and get off. But to me, this is one of those things that is coming soon. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the railroads start to get into this more and more as a way of feeding their iron-tired devices. Fabulous. Miss Mo, do you think you're going to see some autonomous vehicles in the great state of Texas? I hope so, because we've got a whole lot of nothing out here and a lot of <laughs> a lot of ground to cover. Um, and and uh, to the point that you uh, you made a comment about it, and then Lou uh, just uh, Curtis just uh, added to it uh, with the autonomous trains. Uh, we actually that was a bite that we did this uh, year of uh, the Australian autonomous trains, and it, so you can almost look at those as a proof of concept. Uh, that, that Australia being another place that has a whole lot of nothing, and the uh, I think they were up into the millions of kilometers that these uh, trains had traveled already. Uh, just in the year that they had been uh, implemented with um, with huge success and a, gr a great cost savings as well. Fabulous. You know, I know it's happening because my wife's birthday present 
a Subaru Outback actually has not only lane keeping, you know, it'll tell them when you come, it'll actually drive, you know, that self keep in the lane and make turns. It's kind of creepy watching that wheel turn by itself. But anyway, <clears throat> we're going to throw this back to Lou because we need to go and say thank you to another one of our sponsors. We have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's IT Pro TV. Now, kick off 2020 by accelerating your career or getting your IT team certified. IT Pro TV's edutainers blend education and entertainment to make learning IT engaging and fun. You get the most out of your learning with practice tests and hands on learning. Prepare for tough, certification examinations with practice questions. Take and retake tests to ensure you're ready before you sit for that exam. Now try out your skills on virtual machine labs with multiple instances of Windows Server, desktop clients on OS X, Linux, iOS devices, Windows platforms, and more. Explore the different IT career paths that IT Pro TV can help you reach. Entry-level IT, system administration, desktop support, cloud technology, and so much more. Premium members can take advantage of their one-on-one -on -one learning coach services should you need a little extra guidance. Become part of IT Pro TV's family with either a standard membership, video only, or a premium membership, video and labs and practice tests. Grow your career at itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 to receive 30% off. That's itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. We thank IT Pro TV for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. All right. <clears throat> we are now to the current year. We're looking at what kinds of things do we think are going to happen by June of 2020, the first half of the year. And we're going to have Mr. Lou talk about it first. Thank you, sir. Well, we've, we've done a lot of stories this year focused around ransomware. Obviously, we talked a little bit about that in our previous predictions as well. I be, in fact, I, I bet you each one of you here on the crew have heard of a story or can tell of a story about a town near them that have been subjected to. In fact, there's been towns, cities, local governments that really aren't safe to ransomware and, and the amounts are actually on the rise that they're actually costing these companies in these, these areas. Now, just this past week, even New Jersey's largest hospital system had a ransomware attack disrupting its computer network. Uh, and in fact, guess what? The hospital decided just to pay it out because it was easier, it was simpler, and it was faster for them to get their data back than do so. Um, now, the kicker here is you're starting to see a lot more companies do this. Uh, and so my prediction for especially the first part of 2020 is that we're going to see a couple things. One, we're going to start to see a greater adoption of ransomware protection as a service. Now, these are some new services that are out there. there are companies from like, for instance, Checkpoint, Zone Alarm, Anti-Ransomware, uh, Acronis, Malwarebytes. They all have these different services that they're starting to put out there um, and start to charge. And they're starting to use both machine learning and AI um, on your hot paths of data to determine whether they see some strange activity and whether there are possibilities of possible ransomware that, that could be detected or uh, applied to your data space systems. The second part is we're starting to see cyber insurance go up um, because obviously companies, it's, the insurance companies are getting smart. Uh, they're starting to know that, hey, we, we, we want loopholes into the system uh, to make sure that this cost is not going to go up for us. So you're going to start to see those premiums go up. And then finally, backups. Um, as part of those insurance policies for as a loophole, because insurance companies love loopholes, is that they're going to start asking for that you back up your, your, your data as well. So it's going to be a requirement. So you're going to start to see more and more companies start to uh, actually pay this out and, and take on that, that part of the thing as cost of doing business to start backing up their system. So we're going to start to see those three things as they're applied to ransomware in the, in the beginning part of this year. Absolutely fabulous. Will, Mr. Kurt, thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? No, I think absolutely thumbs up. And as a matter of fact, I think we're going to see more and more involvement of insurance companies with IT in every direction. Ransomware is the most obvious because there is money involved. But I think we're going to see it in many other areas, including things like regulatory compliance, especially when it comes to uh, privacy regulations, where again, if you get it wrong, the money talks. So definitely, possibly, or not possible? I'll go with definitely. All right, Miss Mo, your turn. Thumbs up or thumbs down? 
I'm going to give it such a big thumbs up that I swear I thought that was my prediction. I, <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think we are unanimous with this one. Um, we all think it's going to happen. Kurt, you've got a set of predictions coming up. Tell us about it. Well, on my coming up by the end of the year, I think what we're going to see is the rise of deep fakes. And as a matter of fact, I'll put something specific in there. I think we're going to see at least one deep fake make a significant impact on business or politics by the middle of the year. Somewhere we're going to see either a political leader, a business leader, or both who gets spoofed so effectively that the market or the political world is moved before the fake can be discovered and proven. Furthermore, it's going to be good enough that there will be some individuals who say that it's true regardless of what evidence is shown to the contrary. So deep fakes are something that we're going to have to deal with. They're getting better, and there's something that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with before, well, fake news becomes the only news. Fabulous. Uh, Lou, what do you think? Definite, possible, not possible? I think definite. I think we're in an election year, right? And I think that there's going to be a lot of call-outs and disruptions here, in the, especially the beginning part of the year, uh, that have to do with this type of thing. Defakes is one of those things that is on the rise. You can go out and buy a small piece of software, even just on trial uh, software, trialware, where you can actually go and produce these deep fakes. Uh, I see lots of people on YouTube doing it quite a bit. So I definitely think this will be applied and it'll be applied and it's going to be harder for people to tell There's uh, what's going on, what's right news, what's fake news, what's not fake news. Um, so I definitely think Curtis is right here for sure. All right, Mo. Thumbs up, thumbs thumbs up, terrifying, thumbs up, terrifyingly um, uh, uh, that uh, not just possible that it's it's absolutely going to happen uh, so much so that I actually think that there's been some stories already in 2019 um, that things like this have happened or that uh, an event happened and somebody tried to claim it was a deep fake as a to uh, cover up that they had actually that the the, the footage was actually accurate. I'm going to add to his prediction, though, just to give it a positive spin going into the new year, that the proliferation of these deep fakes is going to lead to a rejuvenation in critical thinking um, training and, and education so that uh, people are going to be better able to stop, drop, and think. I'm going to agree. You know, I'm sad to say, but I'm going to agree. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Noise versus world changing. Ms. Mo, tell us about it. Okay. So once again, call me an optimist, but I believe that 2020 is the year that we as a society are going to re begin to recognize the difference between noisy technologies and those that are actually going to rock our world. We're going to quit talking about things like uh, we're going to quit talking about 5G like we're excited chipmunks with the cure for cancer. We're going to finally realize that everything cloud doesn't mean that you don't need backups or a well-implemented uh, disaster recovery plan. And even Joe Schmo is going to realize that our privacy and our PII is worth putting GDPR teeth into. And this is going to lead to a VPN renaissance. The masses are going to encrypt their traffic. All of it. All of the time. Please don't wake awesome. me up yet. Give me a few more minutes to dream. Fair enough. Mr. Lou, what do you think? You know, I, I definitely think that this is something that's coming. Um, I'm not convinced that it will happen right in the beginning of the year, only because there's a lot of limitations uh, to current protocols and technology that kind of prevent this from happening, I think, right away. But I definitely see it. Like, for instance, we're seeing this in browsers and so on, new technologies coming to both encrypting, uh, you know, HTTPS, DNS over HTTPS, that kind of thing, and kind of forcing this as the norm. I would say the adoption will be slower. I, you know, I almost say would say that Mo is right to the point where it may be in like the mid part of this year coming uh, that we're going to start seeing this more and more. So I, I, I kind of give like a midway thumbs up predict maybe so possible 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 yeah. kurt what do you think 
Well, I would love to agree with Mo, but I'm afraid that uh, she has let that Texas spirit of optimism get the best of her. I'm going to have to go with a, uh, I don't think so. I Remember, we're a society that gave rise to pet rocks and billy bass. Uh, and I don't see a tremendous amount of evolution that's happened since then. So while there, there might be more emphasis on more productive technologies, I think that uh, our ability to be distracted by the flashy and twinkly light should not be underestimated. So you want to call that not possible or possible? Uh, oh, I'll go full curmudgeon here and call it not possible. I'm going to give it a Viagra needing thumb. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm going to call it a possible and the only reason why I call it possible is I think the VPN res renaissance, I don't think that's going to happen. I think people are afraid of it because of so many VPN services having breaches of their own. So I'm just going to give that a possible. Well, I'm going to roll into mine. And I'm going to say, remember how back in the early 80s, PCs snuck in the back door and the IT guys – you know, actually it was management infor information systems back then, they were blind to this. I think IoT sensors and things like that are going to do the same thing. I'm seeing Node Red sneaking in the back door. I'm seeing um, things like Cayenne. We've had them on the show. I'm seeing IoT sneaking in the back door. I'm seeing people wanting to go and find out, is the air conditioner, uh, is the computer room air conditioner in my data center leaking? Is the the temperature readings really real? Is my humidity real? Um, things like that, or you know, all kinds of stuff. So I think IoT has gotten so easy to deploy with these drag and drop programming systems, codeless, that I think IoT is going to have a renaissance this year, especially with things like AT and T and. Verizon and T-Mobile, all doing things like LTE Cat M1, which is super cheap. You know, some people have called it as low as thirty dollars a year for low, you know, under a meg per month. Um, we also have narrow uh, LTE narrow band, which is all taking the place of 2G. So, I'm going to throw this and say I think this is going to happen this year. I think it's going to happen in the first half of the year. Um, Lou, what do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely think that the first half of the year, I think we're going to go to CES this year and we're going to see uh, tons and tons of applications here. Um, you know, the different villages that they have there, um, we're going to see a ton of this. Um, and as you said, you're going to start seeing services applied to these special devices as well. Um, so I, I definitely think a thumbs up for that one for sure, Chibert. Kurt, you agree with me? Yeah, I'm going to go thumbs up as well, and uh, not just because I trust your prognostication, but because I have talked to a number of engineers, a number of developers across many different uh, phases of the industry, and all of them talk about this coming. And especially because we're seeing more and more business units developing applications, um, things like the 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 Node Red, the the programming frameworks add a layer of security and protect the line of business developer from being able to do some of the more egregiously stupid things possible with lower level coding. So I think there are a lot of incentives to make it happen. I think it's on, on its way. Thank you. Ms. Mo, what do you think? A hundred percent. It's, it's practically already there. Um, the, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this IoT traffic um, uses the Wi-Fi network. And so I'm seeing in all of our key verticals um, uh, across the enterprises, uh, uh, people uh, looking for uh, various um, applications like this. Um, I was at a Wi-Fi conference earlier this year um, in September of uh, 2019, and a, a, a pretty big guy in our industry got up and spoke uh, for about an hour about how to design a Wi-Fi network to support, and there was an IoT application there. Not one person asked um, whether he should do it. Everybody was talking about how to do it. 
um, I, I submitted that we should have had a he said, she said uh, talk because um, he was actually putting a uh, an IoT, a bunch of IoT sensors in a network in a building that was so secure he had to be escorted through. And yet they were paying him to install all of these little um, uh, side door and back door uh, security risks. Um, so I'm going to add to your prediction that it's going to happen and somebody's going to get bitch slapped for it. Um, and, and there's going to be a major bre- breach you Using that, um, and so there's my there's my curmudgeonly uh, prediction <laughs> for you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mo. Anyway, um, you know we're going to throw this back to Lou because you know what, we need to pay some bills, and he's going to talk about our next sponsor. This episode of this week in Rice Tech is brought to you by address verification leader Melissa. Every address is covered by from Adelaide, Australia. To Zipakita, Colombia, and everywhere in between. We all know there's nothing good about bad data. It costs money, hurts sales, and decreases customer satisfaction. If bad addresses, duplicate records, and bouncing emails are hurting your business, isn't it time to come clean with Melissa? Well, Delta Fawcett, Z1 Motorsports, and Cardigo use Melissa. You should too. Now, Delta Fawcett was able to improve their call center processes with global address auto completion. Melissa was able to reduce the fraudulent e commerce transactions for Z1 Motorsports by 90%. Melissa provides a full spectrum of data quality protection for your customer data. Verify postal addresses, mobile numbers, and email addresses. Update the addresses of customers that have moved and eliminate duplicate records. Gain additional customer insight into your data with Melissa's analytics as well. Now, easily build address verification and customer data validation into your custom application using Melissa's APIs, CRM cloud connectors, and e-commerce plugins, or upload your customer file for a quick data cleanse. Melissa is serious about securely managing your data. They continually undergo independent security audits to reinforce their commitments to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Mailers spend about $20 billion annually in undeliverable mail. Don't lose customers or cash. Make every address count. Bad data happens to good companies. That's why 10,000 organizations worldwide trust Melissa to get their customer data clean and accurate. Get started today with 25,000 records cleaned for free. That's $75 value at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit or call 1-800-MELISSA to find out more. And we thank Melissa for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now back to you, Cheebert. And we are happening now. We are going for the predictions that we think are going to happen by the end of 2020. And we're going to let Mr. Liu start this off. Thank you, sir. Well, last year it was machine learning. uh, And this year I think it's going to be AI, but not as you think. Now, the subject here is a little different. Now, corporations are starting to adopt many things that have to do with AI. But these things not only have positive effects, but also harmful effects as well in the industry. Uh, For instance, gig workers out there, they're starting to see more algorithmic worker management, especially control systems uh, around the gig economy. In fact, they're starting to call them algorithm wage control. Um, And these are, as an example, for instance, in cities, how like Instacart and DoorDash were found to actually be collecting fees from customers who thought they were leaving a tip for their driver. So they were actually saying, hey, you know what, we're going to we're going to gain some more money back if you're going to give a tip out. Uh, and they're going to start a new prediction there. Uh, kind of weird in some cases. In fact, uh, since this is an election year, uh, the topic is going to come up quite a bit. Um, for instance, despite the lack of evidence, the, there's actually machines out there that were are starting to do emotion recognition. Um, and in fact, it's estimated that particular technology is $20 billion market. Uh, and that, so in fact, um, you know, Emotion recognition can actually amplify race and gender disparities uh, around the world. So this is something that's going to start to come out very much so. Uh, in fact, UK has been under the gun uh, to end their use of racially biased algorithms and a lot of things that they're doing as well. So my forecast here is that AI will not only help, but it'll become a much bigger problem this year. Um, that will be part of the political discussion, not only in this country, in the United States, but as well as worldwide. 
uh, and companies around the world will be asked to start being regulated. I think it's going to be more of a regulation ask. Uh, and we're, they're going to be starting to ask that companies and people, people are going to want to start owning their data. They're going to, want to start owning what companies use, it, use their data for. Uh, and I think this is going to be a huge topic this year, especially by the end of 2020 for sure. What do you guys think? Well, you know, Kurt, I'm going to let you wade into this one first. Well, I think that uh, large chunks of what Lou just said, I'm going to agree with. Uh, we are going to see AI taking more and more of a role in our lives. And here's the thing. It's going to be happening in a way that most people will not even notice that it's happening. Because, frankly, most people would not call what goes on with Alexa, with Siri, uh, with Cortana, artificial intelligence, even though we know that it is. So I think we're going to see more of that, more predictive AI and machine learning from things like um, predictive maintenance programs that uh, have an impact on people in their work. Um, we're, we're going to see a lot more of that happening. Now, the place where I think Lou may be overly optimistic is when he's talking about ownership of personal information and people taking control of their data. For most people in the United States, at least, and I'm going, to, I'm going to separate us from, say, those in Europe, that horse may be already out of the barn. Uh, because even if you start to take more control over what happens to your data on a single service, what we see now is the rise of data brokers and data accumulators who are pulling together seemingly innocuous data from many different sources to build incredibly complex and complete pictures of our online and in real life lives. And so I think that it's going to be very, very difficult to pull back on that, even though for most individuals, it's going to be used to make their lives a bit more convenient and remove some of the friction that can add annoyance and cost to getting things done. Hmm. Interesting. So what do you think, Mo? You want that friction or you don't want that friction? <laughs> well, I'm going to remain cautiously optimistic about this still, uh, even though you guys keep shooting that down, um, because <laughs> I, I, I I think that the, the technology is going to be there and be used. And again, it, uh, you're, you, you guys are both are all right. It depends on what part of the world you're in. Um, think that we're going to see abuse of some of these technologies, especially in Asia, um, and that this may be enough of a wake-up call to Americans um, to take a look at, at, at how that's being used, and they may take a, a, a more uh, decided interest in uh, privacy. So I go back to the VPN revolution. Right on. You know, <laughs> I'm going to agree, but, you know, there is one thing. I think that last portion about privacy and so forth, I don't think that's going to happen unless America wakes up and actually does something even similar, not the same, but maybe even similar to GDPR. So I'm going to label that as a possible rather than a definite. Well, Kurt, we've got something interesting. What do you do becomes a significant authentication factor? Yeah, what we're, what we're starting to see, and again, this is one of those things that's happening for many people without them really even noticing it, is that behavior is becoming one of the factors for multi-factor authentication. So in a large scale, let's say if you're talking about the way that you log into your work computer, behaviors such as the time of day you normally log in, where you are when you normally log in, what you're doing around the time of your login with your devices. For that matter, which devices you have in proximity of the system you're logging into. All of these tend to fall into patterns that we develop without thinking about it. And yet those patterns identify us as uniquely as our fingerprints. They identify us uniquely, especially when the authentication scheme doesn't specify precisely which factors it's looking at. And so we're going to see more and more those behavioral factors becoming part of a multi-factor authentication. Now, when I talk about the way that we've seen this already, think about the little electronic signature that you give when you uh, 
the amount keeps going up and up and up. But when you do have to sign a, a, a pin pad uh, for a credit card transaction, you sign your name. The algorithm looks somewhat at the shape of the letters. Maybe does the picture of your um, signature look like the picture that you have on file? But it also looks at behavioral things, the speed of various strokes, the pressure on the pen pad, the mechanics of that signature. Those are things that are much more difficult to copy than just the shape of the signature. And that's why the behavior is much more reliable than just the image. For all of those reasons, and the fact that this is done using existing technology, I think that the behavioral aspect is going to become a bigger piece of multi-factor authentication and secure transactions and logins for our systems. Oh, I don't know. That's a tough one. Mr. Lou, agree or disagree? I would say agree. Um, there's companies are always looking for to in, add additional entropy into the system when it comes to authentication. And I think that uh, behavior as well as other factors will come into play here for sure. Um, and you'll start to see these uh, be applied. In fact, I saw some papers come out from either IEEE or uh, ACM about some additional algorithms that include a different, different, different levels of entropy when it comes to authentication. Uh, and I definitely see we're going to see more adoption here for sure. So I, I give a thumbs up for sure. All right. Mo, a.k.a. Nero, Nero uh, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down? I, I, I actually agree. I'm pretty sure that I saw this uh, in an episode of Leverage uh, several years ago. So the, uh, the, I think 2020 is the time to make it a, a, a reality. And I'll go one further. Uh, it was just today I logged into uh, Twitter from a different VPN that placed me in a different part of the world. And I got a Twitter alert uh, saying that this was a, a device that they had not seen before. Um, so I think that uh, 2020 is it, that this is where this is going to happen. And you know what? I agree almost. I think this is going to be one of those issues that the general public is going to freak out over. So I'm only going to give this a possible instead of a definite because I think somewhere in, in the line when we start rolling these off, I'll bet you someone like Facebook or whatever starts making a big deal about it and the general public is going to freak out and is going to put it back at least another six months to a year. Well, Mo. We have something that's Wi-Fi related. The rise of <laughs> non-Wi-Fi RF protocols. Da -da -da. That's <laughs> right. So 2019 saw most Wi-Fi conferences and professionals giving CBRS the cold shoulder in favor of some sexier and, dare I say it, some easier to understand non-Wi-Fi RF protocols. And while the world was losing its mind over the second coming of 5G and 6 gigahertz, Private LTE and, and CBRS have finally gotten the attention of Wi-Fi professionals. In the coming year, there's going to be an inordinate amount of time spent by enterprise architects and in, uh, engineers. Um, they're going to need to explain the differences between all of these. You're going to have executives who hear all the pie-in-the-sky promises from sales and marketing people who are all trying to push their own solutions. Um, and they're going to need that translated into why and how this fits into their enterprise. So we have CBRS, 5G, Wi-Fi 6 um, sales pushes that are just going to dominate the enterprise conversation. Um, the amount of data that's being put on the wired and wireless network is only going up. And depending on which wireless approach you take, the wired network is finally going to have to uh, try to keep up with the wireless. I think that there's a chance that T-Mobile's 600 megahertz service is going to break into the enterprise space. Um, given that this technology gives them a range that no other cellular provider can match, it's possible, I say with crossed fingers, that they will be able to deliver that thing that's really a holy grail for those of us in rural America, broadband parity. Ooh. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Lou. Dude. <laughs> Your opinion, please. 
So I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a networking expert, but I can definitely say that with the advent of a lot of SD-WAN technologies out there, this layer especially is going to be kind of hidden away from a lot of networks and a lot of services out there, which means that if they need to adopt new to protocols uh, to be more efficient, to have more connectivity and speed and reliance and reliability, I definitely think it's going to happen. So I, I'm going to give a thumbs up, even though, again, I'm I'm kind of like out of this space. I'm not definitely not an expert, but I definitely can see this happen. Happening, uh, especially from an abstraction point of view, for sure. Cool. Kurt, what do you say, dude? I tend to say uh, yes, because there are just so many devices that need to communicate. And, you know, the, the chunks of the spectrum that are dedicated to both Wi-Fi and cellular data plans are getting crowded. So I think that we're going to be looking for other parts of the spectrum to, uh, to take over for, you know, typically machine-to-machine -machine communications. Now, here's a, the word of caution. Well, I, I'll go ahead and give this a, a definite, I think it can happen. My word of caution is that we're already seeing large international corporations vying for poorly used or what they consider to be underutilized chunks of the spectrum. And if they see some of these and start snapping them up, then it's going to slow things down for wide adoption as little chunks of the spectrum get eaten up for proprietary uses. So that's my that's my caution, but in general, I think this is spot on. You know what? I'm going to go for possible, only because there's so many things coming out. You know, we've got white space, uh, we've got LTE, we've got CBRS, we've got LoRa, we've got Zigbee. All these things are coming out. I think because there's so much noise in this market that it's going it's going to be maybe, 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 um, what are we going to do? In fact, there was a um, big conference here in Honolulu for Indigenous Peoples, and, and a major LTE vendor donated – the equipment, and I think that was in an effort to have a ma a fairly major um, sales reference. So right now, I think there's going to be a lot of effort to get that going, but I don't know. I'm going to give it a possible. Now we're going to roll into my prediction since we're starting to run out of time. This one I think should go fast. I think the tablet market is dying, even though I carry um, iPad Mini in my cargo pockets and my shorts all the time. I think that market is going to disappear and shrink into the vertical market. I think it's going to be people using it for manuals. I think it's reference and things like that. But I think for a daily carry, I think tablets are going to disappear to be replaced by f fat blitz, fat, however you pronounce that, fat, fat tablets <laughs> or whatever, you know, yep. If they, if they ever manage to figure out how to make a folding smartphone not crack in the center, I think that's going to be the death knell for tablets. So, Lou, you're first up. What do you think? You know, I think they've, they've been trying for years to make these phablets, the ones that are the, you know, the phone tablet replacement. So they're much larger than a normal phone, but big enough so that you can still use it for consumption and production of content and, and other things. I would say that this might be the year that we see a reduction in tablet uh, use and consumption, but I don't think it'll go away just yet. I definitely think there's devices that are coming out that are more uh, always connected type devices that are more traditional laptop like devices like the Chromebooks of the world. Uh, and we're going to see more adoption of that this year. Uh, but I don't think that tablets themselves will go away uh, until those things become more uh, more prevalent. So I, I would say that I would give a, a, you know, a possible. Okay. Kurt, you agree with Lou? Um, I don't know, because here's, here's the thing. To me, the biggest argument against the, uh, the fat phone, the, the, the super large phone taking over, um, is the fact that, well, I'm on the tail end of the baby boom, and I can't do my daily work on one, at least not comfortably. Uh, tablet? Yeah, Sure. Uh, with the right uh, accessories and the right interfaces, that form factor works really well for me. Phone is an emergency thing. So 
as long as the over 40 generation is a large part of the working group among people, I think the tablet's going to hang on. To me, though, the, the real the real question is whether the tablet is going to become the predominant work device or a lighter laptop. I've seen arguments for both. I don't know. I think that both have their places, and I'm not willing to go out of a limb. So I'm going to give yours a possible, but uh, I'm not confident. Mo, what do you think? Possible, definite, or ain't going to happen? So I guess I am going to be the curmudgeon on this one. So uh, the, <laughs> I don't see that it. I don't see it happening. Uh, or I, I, for a couple of reasons, and I'm going to argue with myself here. So I'm a Wi-Fi engineer. This is what we do. Um, the, the, I see the trend where for the under forty crowd, um, they. I never see tablets in their hands. They, the, the phone, and I don't actually. I, I'm going to go out and say that I don't think the the fat phone or the fat the phablet. Um, I don't think that's going to happen because I think you're going to end up with you know people who um, like the kids these days using their phone for absolutely everything, including reading fan fiction, things that maybe Curtis and I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with. Although I do carry a, a larger than average phone. So, and I'm perfectly uh, happy with that. I actually don't use my tablet um, nearly as much as I did a couple of years ago. It's it's relegated to my backup device for when I'm traveling so that I have um, access to the uh, my, uh, my uh, podcasts that I want to listen to or books that I want to listen to while I'm, I'm going down the road um, just for when the battery dies on my phone, which is my primary device um, for everything. Uh, the form factor though for tablets is perfect for a lot of things like running your Tesla. Um, so I think that, we're, I don't know that it's going to be a personal device, but I think it's still going to be used. It's just, I, I think that what we're going to see is tablets are going to be repurposed and used in ways um, that we're not seeing them. Uh, they're not going to be in people's hands so much. They're going to be on something or in something that we're, uh, we're interfacing with. Very cool. <clears throat> well, and that's what I like. You know, everybody's got different opinions and, we have a wide variety of experiences. But anyway, let's toss this back to Lou because, you know, we've run out of time. <laughs> That's right. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the Best Day Enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 crystal balls. But I do want to make sure I thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to our co-hosts. Thank you, guys. Fabulous show today. We had such a great year here on Twy, and we couldn't do it without you guys. Happy New Year to all of you, starting with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, thank you for such a great year. Where can the folks find you and all of your work? On Twitter, I am ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab, or better yet, throw me an email. I'm Chebert at twit.tv. I think it's probably better hit all the hosts, and that's twit at twit.tv. Love to hear from you. Love to hear your show ideas. And I predict that we're going to have a great 2020. I agree. I agree. Well, I also want to thank the queen of Wi-Fi, Heather Williams, for Record Ruckus Networks. Heather, thank you so much for a fantastic year. Thank you for being here. Where can the folks find you and all of your work? <laughs> well, my snark you can find on Twitter. I'm Mo Better <laughs> Wi-Fi. Um, for anybody who is at any of the uh, Black Hat events around the world in 2020, um, I take uh, tributes of coffee, and I will give you out the uh, free Wi-Fi password at any of those events. Just stop by the knock and say hey. <laughs> And I think, of course, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin from Dark Reading. Curtis, thank you for all your wisdom throughout the year. Thanks for being on Twyat, being such a great co-host. Where can the folks find you and all of your work? Well, you can always find my work at Dark Reading and especially at the edge of Dark Reading. I've got uh, a number of pieces that came out over the holiday weeks. Uh, i got lots more coming up in the future. Uh, find me there. I'll point to that on my Twitter feed at KG4GWA. And now that we're here at the new year, that means we're only about six weeks away from RSA. So if you're going to be out at RSA in San Francisco, hit me up on Twitter. Would love to meet you in real life. Thanks, Curtis. Well, folks, we have to thank you as well. You're that person that keeps 
coming back each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to continually catching up on your enterprise news. So go out right now to our show page, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of the amazing back episodes, the information about our show notes, co-hosts, guest information, as well as the links to all the show stories that we do during the show, especially to some of our predictions that we did there as well. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Get the show and help support the show by subscribing for your audio version, your video version, your HD video version of your choice. Listen in on any one of your devices or on your favorite podcasting application. We love doing this show. And if you subscribe, we can continue doing it. So support the show by subscribing. And after after you subscribe, go ahead and share the show with your coworkers, your friends, your family. If you want to have a really great new year, you definitely want to keep your information, your enterprise news on the ball there. So definitely share it with your friends and family. Also, remember, we do this show live each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. So come out and show, watch the show live, live.twit.tv. You can do that. And in fact, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well check out the chat room as well. We have some great characters in there at irc.twit.tv. There we actually post people post questions, discussions. We go on a different path sometimes in the show, definitely because of all the characters within the chat room. So feel free to jump in there and join us. Now, if you can't be here live as well, you can always go to twit.community and join the community and all the discussions with all of our show hosts, uh, all of the content that we do during all of our shows, as well as some really just great technology discussions that we have out there. So twit.community, join the community as well. Also, don't forget, you can follow me at twitter.com slash LouMM. There you'll find all of my work that I do at Microsoft. I post a lot of comments about that, especially all the stuff that's coming up here at CES. Of course, my holiday company curmudgeons that I, or, or problems that I have with companies out there, I'll post them out there as well. Of course, if you want to check out everything that I do my, during my daily work week at Microsoft, you can always check out dev.office.com. There we post the latest and greatest ways to make your office suite more productive for you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support this week Enterprise Tech and all of the co-hosts. And we couldn't do this show without them. Thank you so much and Happy New Year to all of you. Also, all the engineers at Twit, I want to thank you also, uh, as well as uh, Brian Chi. I want to thank him again once more because he is our not only our co-host, but also our great producer as well. He does all the show bookings and all of the, the content that we do during the show. He helps produce all of that and we really appreciate all of his work that he does throughout the year we couldn't do this show without him and of course before we kind of go out with a bang for this year i want to thank our td for today john john thank you so much you know i want to start a new tradition i, I want to maybe just get what you think what's your major prediction on technology this year well <laughs> Were you on the spot there, John? Well, I, I, there's all sorts of great, <laughs> all sorts of great predictions. I'm going to go with the deep fake. I really think because it's a election year, I think the deep fakes are going to be an effect in politics this year. I agree with that one. You know, I think you might be right. We'll have to see. We'll have to see if uh, if uh, I think it was Kurt uh, that called that out. If that was right, you know, I definitely give a thumbs up. But thank you so much, John, for all your hard work and your support this year. And remember, until next time, I am Los Moresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. <laughs>